Thank you for spending the time today to uh, join us for this presentation. It's called Caring for Long-Term Care Residents with Vision Loss, Reducing Falls and Increasing Independence. So this session is being recorded. So your participation in this uh, presentation implies your consent to have the recording done. Uh, we will be sending out the slides of the presentation uh, to those on the contact list. Um, and we'd really appreciate if you could take a few moments to click on the chat box um, and enter in the name of your organization and the number of staff that are attending with you on your uh, compute on your computer or laptop so that we can get a, a better estimate of the number of participants. Um, could you please also mute your microphones? Uh, so that there's less background noise as well. And there will be time at the end for answering questions. Um, we will uh, request that you put your questions into the chat box during the presentations. And then at the end, you can open your microphones if you would like and um, ask your questions that way. And one of the presenters will be monitoring the chat box and reviewing those questions at the end. So with us today, we have uh, four presenters in, in total. We have two uh, presenters from Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada. Josie McGee is the Vice President of Healthcare Innovation and Ed Martin is the Regional Manager for West Ontario. I'm Lee Mantini. I'm the RNAO Long-Term Care Best Practice Coordinator for Southeastern Ontario and for the Champlain region. And with me as well is Deirdre Boyle, also an RNAO Long-Term Care Best Practice Coordinator for HNNB and uh, Mrs. Alga Halton. So first up with the presentations will be from Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada, um, and they will discuss with you a little bit about their program, the services they offer. Um, they'll share a scenario uh, showing the impact of the services they offer, and they'll also provide you with some information around how to make referrals to them. And then Deirdre and I will take over and we'll talk about the link between vision loss rehabilitation services and RNAO best practice guidelines. Uh, I'll go over a few general care considerations for residents with low vision and talk a bit about some strategies, tools and resources for uh, false prevention. We'll also uh, look a little bit at the linkages between Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada services and accreditation and ministry inspections. Then we'll talk a bit about next steps and we'll open things up for questions after that. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Josie. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so again, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Josie McGee. I'm the VP of Healthcare Innovation for Vision Loss Rehab Canada. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist by background as well. And uh, so I'm just going to go a little bit, uh, do a little bit of an overview of who we are and what we do and, and how vision loss impacts uh, the health of individuals. Next slide. <clears throat> So who we are. So Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada became a standalone organization in 2018. Uh, at that time, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, where these services uh, were being offered, uh, decided to pull the vision rehab services outside of the charitable umbrella. They felt that these services uh, were right for every Canadian and that they should be funded by ministry. So uh, we are fully funded across Canada with the exception of uh, Quebec, and we are uh, fully funded uh, across Ontario, all the regions in Ontario. Oh, can you go back? Thank you. Um, in 2019, um, our corporate services, our governments, and two of our, our Ontario sites were accredited by CARF, and actually we're just going through CARF accreditation again right now as we speak. Uh, and in 2020, we launched our new strategic plan called AIM Higher, based on the quadruple AIM approach. Uh, we really wanted to look at um, not just vision loss in silo, but um, how that impacted all the healthcare needs of our, of our clients and really wanted to improve patient experience, population health uh, outcomes, you know, looking at financial viability of our, our services, uh, as well as uh, improving the culture of our staff. Next slide, please. Uh, what we do. So vision loss rehab therapy helps people with all levels of vision loss to develop or restore key daily living skills, 
helping them enhance their independence, safety, and mobility. We actually have approximately 65% of our clients are seniors uh, uh, receiving these services. Uh, we do often get referrals from ophthalmologists, optometrists, uh, other healthcare professionals like OTs, um, hospitals that refer their patients with vision loss for uh, therapy as part of their overall care plan. Our therapy is provided by certified uh, therapists uh, who work with individuals and caregivers to meet uh, a personalized rehabilitation plan uh, and to meet the needs and goals of our clients. Next slide. So it's impact on health. So the health consequences associated with vision loss uh, extend well beyond the eye and the visual system. As we know, it affects one's quality of life, their independence, their mobility. It's definitely linked to falls and injury. Um, you know, our, our clients are four times as likely to have falls uh, three, three years earlier into uh, long-term care, um, higher incidence of, of hip fractures, uh, but it also spans mental health, cognition, social function, employment, and educational attainment. It not only impacts the, the individuals who have vision loss, but also those who sur uh, surrounding them and their caregivers and their families. And that loss or deterioration of existing eyesight can be very frightening and overwhelming, often leaving those impacted with many questions about their ability to maintain their independence. Because of the falls and injury and often medication error, errors that are a result of vision loss, uh, there is increased utilization of acute care resources. Uh, as we also know, there is limited vision care for individuals in congregate settings like assisted living or long-term care homes. And, uh, you know, little support in sort of really factoring in the vision impairment, uh, you know, and how that impacts uh, falls in, in uh, our clients. COVID-19 has definitely impacted the ability of individuals to visit their eye care professionals. So we're seeing more individuals that are developing a vision impairment. We have people living longer with cataracts. Um, so definitely COVID-19 has um, really put a strain on our clients uh, in terms of their uh, eye care and health care in general. So who's at risk at long-term care centers uh, for a fall with someone who has a vision impairment? So clients identified with the following include two or more falls within uh, a 60 day period. If they've scored two or higher and or answered yes to the visual limitations uh, and visual decline questions on the inter assessment. If they have one of the four major eye diseases like glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration and or cataracts. Uh, if, there, if there are, uh, experience impaired function due to vision loss, and that can be identified either through, uh, you know, what you guys see on a daily basis or through a screener that we have as well that, you know, just asks a few questions to determine whether that function is impaired uh, and or if they actually have a vision loss diagnosis. So I'm going to pass it on now to Ed, who's going to uh, talk about uh, considerations for filtering environments and the services we can provide specifically for long-term care. Thank you, Josie. As mentioned, uh, my name is Ed. I'm a regional manager with uh, Vision Loss Rehab in West Ontario. And um, I'll speak first about the considerations for our built-in environment in long-term care. These recommendations are provided to staff over the course of our service, as well as to supports, families, um, residents. Um, and we recommend after we exit service that uh, clients advocate for some of these large, larger issues, uh, some of these considerations. And they can also be addressed during any in-service uh, we provide to staff uh, around training that's requested by home. So some of the th major things we look at are the layout, location, and brightness of all lighting in rooms and hallways, entrances, and common areas. Uh, we look at wayfinding for visually impaired residents, so adding color, contrast to the environment, verbal descriptors, um, change the furniture where we can if it's uh, within travel paths or in the way of residents with vision loss, or even just make um, furniture and equipment in a more consistent position for people to make their way around them. We do um, look at eliminating hallway hazards, so carts, wheelchairs, hoyer lifts, and wherever possible, adhere to AODA standards relating to consistent railing, 
and position. So adding contrast uh, sometimes to railings can be really, really helpful. One of the other things that leads into our next slide is uh, we do offer mobility training for residents as well on the use of walkers and wheelchairs, canes and equipments. And I'll have you move to the, the next slide. So considerations for uh, those residents in long-term care. Um, we talk a lot about etiquette for individuals with vision loss, especially announcing your proximity or movement or uh, when people are going from place to place. It's great to let residents know who's in the room with them and uh, who's come and who's gone. Uh, we can offer sage guide training both to residents, to uh, clients, to family. Um, and uh, with that often goes wayfinding. Um, and I've made a, a notation in brackets around Braille. But just as an aside, it's kind of an interesting uh, point. We've all seen Braille on room signs and in elevators, but uh, they're seldom used. Um, admittedly, few seniors have the ability to read Braille, but uh, we do have certified Braille teachers at uh, VLR. And so learning numbers from for a room or for floor recognition really could only involve uh, 10 characters max. I had one client there, I was putting a bump dot on the frame uh, of her room on the door frame um, just to help with recognizing when she had arrived and it kept getting removed. So I thought I would just show her the last two numbers on her room, which was, uh, her room was 200. So I was able to teach her 00 and locate it on the placard in order for her to fixate on that position at the end of her route, which was really handy. Um, we encourage ways to change uh, how physical activity is uh, encouraged within a home to make it a bit more accessible for someone with vision loss. Um, we look at considerations during transfers for individuals with vision loss. So we'll often make recommendations around more verbal descriptors, especially as to position who is in the room doing uh, the transfer or a lift and where uh, a client might be moving within that, um, within that transfer. And then of course, uh, reading materials are a big one. We, we look at making it accessible around whether it be large print, audio, braille if necessary, especially for things like uh, newsletters and menus. Um, and we use uh, clear point guidelines for that. Sorry, next slide when you're able. Thank you. So we have um, developed a uh, specialized long-term uh, care fall prevention program to reduce some of the risks uh, of falls of patients in long-term care. And it consists of three main components. So the consultation on a built-in environment, and we can do that with staff. And we do that, of course, over the course of our service. Staff training, I'll mention we do, I've hinted, we do offer uh, an in-service and it can be adopted virtually. Um, but it's really well suited to in-person because with this, we, um, we offer sighted guide training for staff and we do a lot of work um, potentially under blindfold if, if the staff wants or under simulation to sort of uh, give an idea what it's like to live with certain eye conditions that are mentioned in the, in the previous slide. Um, and then we do have our own individual assessment where we work through client-centered goals and treatment. And I'll describe a little bit of that in uh, the next portion during my, my scenario. So um, the, this slide describes a scenario and we have a patient arrives in your long-term care home with significant vision loss as a result of macular degeneration. Um, very few staff in the home work, have worked with a resident with this level of vision loss. And there are behavioral concerns for the resident who switches between anger, confusion, and uh, depression. So I, I've put this scenario out because it, it's an actual client I had the opportunity to work with. I've, I've hinted uh, already that I was a service provider prior to moving into management. Um, I offered orientation and mobility services for the West region with the majority of my work taking place either in hospitals or transitional rehab centers or long-term care. Um, so for this scenario, I actually had a, a confirmed appointment with a different resident 
of a long-term care home in Simcoe, Ontario, actually. Really nice building and great staff. I'd been there for a number of years. Um, the client I was to meet that day, I'll refer to him as Harry, had lost his support cane. So he just needed a replacement and it would have been a really short visit. So we spoke about reviewing some of his old routes and he agreed and traveled through the home together for a little while. The charge nurse I could tell was, was keeping an eye on us and she pulled me aside afterwards to discuss a different client, um, the one described in this scenario and asked if I'd be willing to meet him. I'll call him Fred. Um, and she described this, this client as quite angry and non-compliant to most uh, staff advice. So I returned a few days later after paperwork was in place to meet Fred for an in-person assessment. And I met him in his room and I recall staff supporting on the day. So the basis of our orientation and mobility assessment is to gather information on a resident's knowledge of their surroundings and their travel needs. Um, the first meeting normally lasts between 30 minutes and an hour. And I would describe it as a client-driven, goal-focused functional assessment. So a big part of our assessment is having the residents show skills uh, that are uh, that they have um, in order to move things along and move go and uh, develop goals. So as well with our assessment, any uh, we, we do share information that's gathered um, it, as long as the client consents to sharing um, the assessment, the treatment, and even lesson plans can be shared back with the home or with family, anyone really interested in supporting these goals. So, Fred only had an understanding of three locations in his residence. The window where he felt a breeze, um, the doorway where people came in, and the general location of his roommate, as he could sometimes catch shadows uh, when people were working across the room. Um, in terms of routes, he only mentioned that he was traveling by wheelchair to the bathroom and the dining room. And I was curious about a walker that he had folded up in the corner, as he said, uh, and he said at the time they must have brought that with him and he seemed really upset about any questions around his his travel and his moving around the home um the walker itself appeared well used so i suspected that he had traveled with it prior um i really started to get a sense in assessment how how much his world had shrunken when it came to uh, his move into long-term care but without any training he was really uh, too high risk of, of falls so my plan that was offered and accepted at the time was first we would work on some room familiarization to hopefully reduce some of the confusion uh, that he was exhibiting through uh, a really good orientation of his surroundings. So we looked at sound clues, marking, uh, tactile markings. Uh, railings were a big focus during this work because uh, it, it was along the side of it, the wall of his room. Um, the main issue we were having was items were being placed around him without him knowing, and a lot of personal items were being moved off of his bedside tray and his lunch and his uh, table next to him. And I addressed that with the staff. The second thing we wanted to work on was a few simple routes, one to the bathroom and the second to the dining room. So I saw decent stability and a pretty steady great gate over a short distance with a PSW. Uh, and when I asked about the wheelchair, she did confirm that it was only being used to due to a risk of falls. So the travel routes were accomplished over several months of practice with some really good PSW support. Um, the bathroom was easy for him uh, after room orientation as he, as he used those railings that I mentioned. And he could touch travel and use them for support along the outside of his room to where a small washroom had some additional grab bars as well. The route to the dining room took quite a bit longer. It was about 50 meters from this resident's room to where he had lunch and dinner. And we needed to use the walker for this longer route. Um, he used what I call a modified form of touch trailing where he would take four steps and check his distance from the railing at the wall and then travel for more and continue on until he reached his destination. Um, I also added a few things to his walker. We have a traveler with vision loss sign that I affixed to the front and I put on um, the side of the walker um, an ID cane. I twist tied 
and folded up a, a little ID cane, a red and white ID cane on a vertical bar on his walker. So by the second lesson, I had uh, quickly expanded the amount of information along his travel path. And I started mentioning some name cards of the residents um, along the doors that we took our route. And the room right next to his was Harry's, the very first client that I had mentioned I'd gone to see. And he said to me at the time, oh, I think he sits at my table and he smiled just, just a little bit. And thinking back, um, to that second lesson, I, I'm pretty sure it was a turning point for him in our service. So initially I was only visiting, or sorry, I was visiting twice a week. And again, PSW was monitoring and supporting his travel around the building when, when we weren't in lesson. Um, there was a particularly keen PSW working with Fred, uh, who I was always excited to see when I came. Um, and after a month, I was uh, down to once a week, but I could add a rehab assistant uh, from our agency to support some of his practice. So the goals, as small as they might seem, took, did take about three months with us. And uh, in my last few visits, I never found him in his room. He was usually in a sitting area next to the dining room. And when I asked how he uh, figured out how to navigate that new space, he said, oh, Harry told me. And I thought, oh, what a great way to tie up service with that individual. It was a really good closing out for, for Fred in, in our service together. So, okay, let's move to our next slide. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about our, our referral process. This is a specialized program we've developed and we do have client care navigators in place to coordinate all services for long-term care facilities and their clients. Um, referrals can be made by calling a client care navigator directly or using our website below, um, but I'll also be acting as kind of a point person for this, um, for this as well. And my information is here too. So if you ever want to be connected directly with a, a navigator or a registrar to, to get the process rolling around uh, our reports and getting them in our system, then you're more than welcome to contact me directly and my information is there, as well as a lot on um, that previous website about our agency and the other services that we provide. And uh, I believe that's my portion and I will turn it over to Lee. Lee, you're on mute, Lee. My mistake, sorry. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to provide you with a bit of information around uh, the long-term care best practices program at RNAO and the role of the RNAO long-term care best practice coordinator. And I'm doing this because there's been a significant amount of turnover of staff and management in the long-term care sector over the last couple of years. And there's several people on the um, presentation today who do not work in long-term care. So I'd just like to share a little bit so everybody um, knows what we're about. Uh, so the, the uh, RNAO Long-Term Care Best Practices Program is funded by the Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Long-Term Care, uh, but it is run by RNAO. Um, and uh, what ha the, across Ontario, there are several long-term care best practice coordinators who offer free services to all of the homes in Ontario. Uh, we typically go out and have an initial visit with the director of care, and if the administrator is available, that is great as well. Uh, and we just have a, a, a really relaxed conversation about uh, what they see as the practice priorities, areas that they're interested in have it, doing quality improvement. And from there, we usually set up a, a second meeting where we do a gap analysis and um, discuss doing some action planning around implementing a best practice guideline. And the gap analysis looks at uh, what you're currently doing and how closely that fits with best practices. So it really helps pick out those things that you can work on for quality improvement. Uh, the best practice coordinators also can help with yearly program evaluation um, by redoing those uh, gap analysis as a gap analysis review. Um, and we're always in the background available to answer any questions by email or phone to connect you with other homes that are implementing best practice guidelines and to offer you resources as needed. 
So the reason that uh, RNAO partnered with Vision Loss Rehab is because we saw the value of the work that they were doing and how well it fit with the RNAO best practice guidelines, particularly the person and family centered care guideline and the falls best practice guideline. And these guidelines are all available on the RNAO website that, um, for free download. Uh, so please do go ahead and look on the website to find the ones that you're working on that you would like to do some quality improvement on. Um, with the person and family centered care uh, best practice guideline, there's a list of recommendations inside. And uh, there's also evidence backing up those recommendations that really support why they came about um, deciding these recommendations are the best practices out there. Uh, so when we're looking at person and family centered care, that one of the recommendations in the planning section is uh, developing a plan of care in partnership with the person and really sharing information to promote the understanding of available options for healthcare so that the person can make informed decisions. And you could see that what Ed, what Ed was talking about, could, would you mind please putting everybody on mute so that there's not an interruption with the background noise? Thank you very much. Um, so with the developing of the care plan and the sharing of information with the resident to make informed decisions, those fit really well with what Ed was talking about um, in the services that are provided by vision loss rehabilitation. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Um, the, as I was saying, there was a link to the um, preventing falls and reducing falls injury best practice guideline as well. Uh, there was many recommendations that fit really well with the work of vision loss rehab. I've just picked out three um, sections of the guideline to uh, refer to today. Um, one of them is about uh, doing that comprehensive assessment to identify factors contributing to risk of falls and determining the appropriate interventions for the resident and making sure that you refer your residents to the most appropriate clinicians like, like, like um, Ed's team at Vision Loss Rehab. Um, it also talks about uh, one of the recommendations are, is um, implementing a combination of interventions tailored to the person. And Ed uh, spoke quite, quite uh, clearly about the fact that he looks at the, the more person-centered goals and um, looks at exactly what the resident is capable of doing and, and works on re uh, interventions that fit with the resident. And uh, other recommendations include making sure you have a safe environment and you identify and modify equipment and other factors that contribute to risk of falls. So Ed was also talking about um, keeping the, all the hallway hazards clear and adapting the walker with signage and, uh, and, um, and other um, support equipment uh, to help the residents with low vision loss. So you can really see how it is a good fit with the services and what is best practices. So moving from there, I just want to talk for a second about the cycle of falls. And this can occur with any resident, but it, it, can, all, it, it can really happen when it, it's around um, a resident who has low vision. Uh, they have a fall and then they become fearful of falling. And so they reduce their activity. They start making excuses for not getting involved in, in uh, recreation activities, or they don't wanna go to physio anymore. Or they wanna stay in the room or they wanna use the wheelchair instead of the walker, like Ed was, was saying about that one resident. And what happens then is that they lose their muscle mass and their leg strength, and then they get impaired balance and impaired mobility. And then that just increases the falls. So the point I would like you to take from this is that when you're doing those post falls assessments, don't just think of the physical, physical, think of the psychological impact of that fall. Has the resident become fearful of falling and is that gonna impact on their activity level? So get the physio in there to talk with them, get recreation in there to talk with them, have a sit down with them and really discuss how they're feeling about that fall and, and how they feel about um, continuing with their independent movement moving forward so we can prevent falls from happening again. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the general care considerations for residents with low vision. 
Um, it's almost like those universal fall precautions. These are sort of the universal care considerations. So when you're talking with residents with low vision, you really need to just act like you do with all the other residents. You don't raise the tone of the voice, um, accidentally speak louder than you should speak, things that you just accidentally do that you really have to keep an eye on um, because you don't want to center these residents out. You want to make them feel included and um, the same as others. Um, you want to make sure that if they're getting involved in activities, that they're accessible to them. Um, you want to make sure that all those hazards are cleared away. And as Ed was saying, to really look at the format that's preferred by the resident when it comes to the print materials like Braille or audio or large print. And, uh, and you can get the recreation department involved in that to really look at some specific tools that could be used, say for bingo, could you get braille bingo cards or could you get larger print or could somebody sit with the resident to help them play bingo so that they're not left out. And you should always introduce yourself every time you greet the person and um, introduce those who are nearby them. Uh, a, few, a couple of more considerations that are quite general is making sure that you don't rearrange or move any of the objects in the room or the dining room without their permission. You know how challenging it is when you always have something in the same spot at home and your significant other goes and borrows it and then puts it somewhere else and you can't find it no matter what you do. Okay, you can just imagine if you had low vision and somebody was doing that in your room. So you really have to pay attention to getting permission if you're going to remove things and remind them where it's been moved to. And you need to be very descriptive in, in um, speaking with your residents with low vision. Um, so you have to verbally acknowledge when somebody is entering the room or entering a conversation because the resident won't be able to know that. And also explain who's sitting where. You may want to introduce them, but you also have to say so-and-so is sitting to your right or to your left or directly ahead. Um, you need to use clear and specific directions. Say if a resident was coming out of a washroom looking at this bed in the picture, um, looking in the direction of this, uh, this bed, you could say um, you need to walk 10 steps towards the bed, then hold on to the, the um, footboard, walk another two steps, and then I'm going to help to turn you slightly and you're going to reach back to the armrest because they may forget that there's armrest there because they could have some cognitive impairment as well. And then you're going to sit in your red chair. You don't just say as you're coming out of the bathroom that um, you're just going to walk over to the bed and then sit in the chair. That's not going to help them. You want to keep them as independent as possible by giving them directions to make them do, be, to be able to do what they can do on their own. And the same goes with meal times. For every meal, someone should be putting their plate or their bowl down and explaining where everything is, what's on the plate and where it is based on the clock. So your, your chicken is at six o'clock, your rice is at 12 o'clock and your peas are at three o'clock, something like that, so that they can independently um, manage what's on their plate and feel comfortable eating in front of others. So some of the tools for falls prevention um, they're generalized for all residents, um, but they will work well with the low vision residents as well. Uh, there's the Scott's and the Moore's risk tool. It's an assessment tool that you could use. There's also the BEACH checklist, and that stands for behavior, uh, environment, equipment, um, behavior, environment, equipment, and um, activity and uh, clothing and footwear and health management. So these are just titles and underneath is a, is a whole checklist of items that you can use for specific residents who are frequent fallers um, to really determine which areas you need to focus on for quality improvement for that specific resident. Um, the Falls Best Practice Guideline uh, has an appendices in it that has, is full of really good resources. And there's also a, a long-term care toolkit on the RNAO website that has a Falls section that you can uh, look in for resources as well. The uh, Long-Term Care Best Practice Coordinators have several brochures for Falls prevention that other homes have developed and shared with us. Uh, so if you're planning to update your existing brochure or you'd like to develop one for your families and residents, uh, you could contact your long-term care best practice coordinators and we could certainly supply you with them. 
and uh, there's uh, templates for falls uh, debriefing sessions and osteoporosis Canada has a fracture risk scale uh, which is used to determine if your resident is at a high risk of hip fracture uh, and one of the best tools around is actually looking at your falls data it's one thing to collect your data for reporting but you really need to pull that data sit down as a group and look at what the data is telling you are the are the falls happening at a specific time are they happening on a specific day or in a specific home area what's going on at the time of those falls and is there something we could um, change like break times or lunch hours or something that might be causing a staffing change that's impacting on those falls so really use that data as a tool to figure out what's going on and how you can make changes to prevent falls you can also call um, or email other uh, long-term care homes and see what they're doing in the ways of fall prevention, because many of the homes across Ontario have implemented this falls prevention guideline, and they have a lot of resources available. And coming soon, there's going to be an RNAO point-click care falls clinical pathway that can be, um, be used. So just keep stay tuned for that, and more information will be coming on that. Oops, sorry, just went one ahead. Yeah. Um, there are some strategies uh, that go beyond uh, the use of universal precautions for everyone. Those universal precautions are done so well in long-term care homes, uh, but for individual residents, you sometimes need extra strategies. So some of the things that have come across um, with the homes that I've been working on working with are um, the slipper resistant or slip resistant chairs, chair sheets. And they're like a vinyl silicone sheet that you can put over the seat. And it really, uh, it adheres a bit to the clothing to prevent that slip and fall out of the, out of the chairs. Uh, some homes have found that hip protectors are not widely enjoyed by residents because they're very uncomfortable. And there is a brand out there that you can find online that is made of bamboo fabric, which is much more breathable and softer and seems to be more well accepted by residents. So if there is a resident that really needs the hip protectors and can't manage the other ones that are available, then you may want to speak to the family about um, purchasing the bamboo ones. Uh, some homes use red or yellow slipper resistant socks. Um, not only as a falls prevention uh, strategy, but also as an identifier of those high risk fallers. They just ask the uh, family to hem up their pants an inch or two so that everybody in the home who sees those red and yellow socks knows that these are high risk fallers and to pay a little extra attention to those to make sure that they're safe. And one of the interventions that is um, more widely being used now and is very successful in reducing falls and injuries from falls is purposeful rounding um, and your long-term care best practice coordinators can support you with developing strategies for implementing rounding and that is going around intentionally um, every hour or two hours depending on what your situation is in within your home and asking the residents, do you have pain? Do you have um, a need to go to the toilet or to have your pad changed? Uh, do you need to be repositioned and are all your possessions close by? And then after you've um, assessed that, you say that, uh, you ask if there's anything else you can do for them and remind them that you, know, you or someone else will be back in an hour. And this has consistently reduced falls because the residents know you're coming back, you're toileting them pretty much on demand if you're going in once an hour and you're not having these residents getting out of bed or out of the wheelchair and walking into bathrooms and slipping them falling without support from you. Uh, it also causes um, a significant reduction in call bells as well, we found out. So it might be something you wanna look into. It also reduces pressure injuries and reduces uh, worsening pain and also has an impact on depression and elderly. So it's a really, really important intervention that you may wanna consider for your home and long-term care best practice coordinators can help you with that. Um, another important strategy is continuing that staff education around falls prevention. So having um, small huddles or education sessions and especially celebrating during Falls Prevention Month, um, having some interesting fun activities and posters and uh, getting the residents and the staff involved. 
And there's a site online called the Falls Prevention Month website, and it's there all the time. And it has some great resources and posters and games and whatnot that you can pull from there to help your Falls team um, prepare for Falls Prevention Month. So now I'm going to pass it over to Deirdre so that she can talk about that link between um, vision loss rehab and accreditation and ministry inspections. Thank you, Lee. So as you know, the new Fixing Long-Term Care Homes Act received assent in December of 2021. Currently, the draft regulations are open for stakeholder feedback. The regulations have a very strong focus on person and family-centered care and specify that the resident and the substitute decision maker must be involved in every aspect of the plan of care to the greatest extent possible. Also, CARF and Accreditation Canada have a very strong focus on person and family centered care. And to attain accreditation, it means that you would have to rely heavily on the score in that area. Uh, attaining accreditation results in ministry per diem funding for the long term care home. So, partnering with healthcare providers outside of the home, such as Vision Loss Rehab Canada, will help to deliver care and services that are specific to the needs of the residents in your home. Accreditation Canada's core concepts of patient and family centered care um, include that, you know, they, they specify really that when you implement PFCC, that it increases client and staff satisfaction, it reduces resident frustration, it improves client experience, and improves morale. The link with the ministry inspections is that. Um, quality improvement plans are required for all aspects of the, the ministry regulations and the Long-Term Care Homes Act. And quality improvement plans are required in all aspects of um, PFCC for compliance, accreditation and reporting. Vision Loss Rehab Services provide uh, person-centered care services to the residents, which will result in quality improvement in caring for the residents with vision loss. You can see here, I've just pulled from residents' rights, care and services, that every resident has the right to develop their potential and to be given reasonable assistance by the licensee to pursue these interests to develop their potential. So residents with vision loss, um, they should have reasonable assistance and that would be through uh, Vision Loss Rehab Canada. Further, the, uh, the Act specifies that every resident has the right to receive care and assistance towards independence. And this would be based on a restorative care philosophy to maximize independence to the greatest extent possible. So Ed addressed how he helps people to wayfind, uh, he helps people to use braille and education is provided to staff to help to maximize independence of the residents with low vision. Under general requirements for programs in the Long-Term Care Homes Act, uh, it states that there must be a, play, a process in place for a referral of residents to specialized resources where required. Also, it says that staff must ensure that any equipment, supplies, devices, and assisted aids are appropriate for the resident based on the resident's condition. So for our residents with low vision, the, the devices, et cetera, must be appropriate for them, and Vision Loss Rehab can help with that. In the uh, long-term care legislation under communication methods, it specifies that strategies must be developed uh, to meet the needs of the residents with compromised communication. So in this case, it would include adapting printed materials, uh, perhaps into braille or into large print for those residents, or also um, changing things so that they can be uh, accessed via audio. Um, under plan of care, subsection four specifies that there must be an interdisciplinary assessment for vision. So when you couple that with um, the requirement to partner with uh, care providers from outside of the organization, you know that if you um, partner with Vision Law 3 at Canada, you'll be meeting that requirement as well under the Act. Falls prevention and management in the legislation says that the program must uh, include implementation of restorative care approaches and the use of equipment and assistive aids tailored to the residents' needs. So again, highly specialized for residents who have um, vision loss, you would need the services of the, well, you'd need an interdisciplinary um, 
team assessment, but also the specialized services tailored to the residents' needs, which Vision Loss Rehab Canada can help you with. So what are the benefits of collaboration with RNAO and Vision Loss Rehab Canada? As you can see, uh, collaborating with RNAO will provide you with support to complete your person and family-centered care gap analysis, which will help you with accreditation and provide you with guidance to implement, implement excuse me, evidence-based practice change. And this will also help with your ministry inspections. To help you achieve compliance with ministry inspections, the long-term care best practice team can facilitate a fall and person and family um, center care uh, gap analysis and support practice change in this area. We also assist with developing and evaluating practice change. And what would be the benefit of uh, collaborating with Vision Loss Rehab Canada in this, in this case? That would be, um, you would be supported in meeting the accreditation requirement of partnering with community services to improve resident care. Further, you will be supported in meeting the ministry requirements to promote independence and safety by accessing available services. So you can see how there's a crossover between the services that are offered by Vision Loss Rehab Canada with the best practice guideline team who help implement best practice guidelines. You'll meet the new person family centered care guidelines in part, right? By, by um, making sure that the care plans are resident centered, by partnering with community services and uh, by including the resident in, in their development of their care plan. So all together, if you, if you were to connect with us and with Vision Loss Rehab Canada, you would go a long way towards achieving what's uh, required for accreditation and also what's required for compliance. So what are your next steps? We suggest that you review the slides, uh, which you will be sent by email. Share what you've learned with your peers Discuss uh, vision loss rehab services with your falls prevention team and with your director of care. Refer the residents living with low vision. Contact your long-term care best practice coordinator so we can do a gap analysis with you, action plan with you, do some falls prevention and person and family centered care work. And together we can reduce falls, we can increase independence, and we can promote safe mobility for those living with low vision. So I'd like to open up the um, chat for questions now, please, if you have any, so that we can address them. All right, so we have a question here, um, and this would be for um, Josie, I think. Does the government provide funding for vision loss rehab? Yes, we're fully funded in Ontario. Uh, well, we're funded across Canada, but in Ontario, we're funded in all regions. So these are services uh, are funded to come and provide these services uh, at the long-term care homes. Yep, up to and including any in-service that are recommended for or requested by staff or um, all of the individualized um, plans that I described with that one client. Um, yeah, they're all uh, funded. Can Thanks. someone put up the contact page again? Someone asked uh, if they can, if the contact page can be put back up. Here we go. And of course, we'll send all of these, we'll send the entire slide deck along with the contact information out to um, all the participants here today. And you can always find out more information by connecting with your long-term care best practice coordinator and by uh, connecting with Ed at uh, VLR Rehab. Okay, there's another question. Does Vision Loss Rehab accept referrals for individuals living in uh, supportive living homes that are not funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care? Yes. Yeah, we provide services to individuals, uh, no matter their living situation and no matter uh, the funding uh, predicaments of the, the home that they live. So, yeah, anywhere our clients live, we will go. <laughs> 
Um, I see a question on stats and data for vision loss. I'm happy to um, get that um, together and provide a little bit more detail for the, for the individual who's asked for some specific um, stats and data around vision loss. We can have that sent out. Thanks, yeah. Ed. And, and Jovi mentioned earlier to me that I, I think one in four adults will have vision loss by the age of, I don't know, Josie, I thought you I said 72. So 70, I believe. Is it 70, Ed? Mm -hmm. I believe it's 70. Yeah. One in four uh, seniors will have uh, one of the four major eye diseases by, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, as a former DOC, I would think it would be very important to um, connect with Vision Loss Rehab and with the Falls Prevention Team, with the Long-Term Care Best Practice Team at RNAO, especially given, you know, the new circumstances of the long-term care regulations. You know, they're very, very specific to including uh, collaboration with outside agencies and being very, very resident specific to promote independence. So I think, um, you know, if one in four of my residents has a diagnosis of, of low vision, then it would um, be to, to their benefit and the home's benefit to connect with you. Um, there's another, well, thank you. We have, a, we have a compliment. Thanks for this excellent <laughs> presentation. Very comprehensive. Thank you, Marianne. That's appreciated. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> and um, we have a question. Can we send a referral for general education for staff regarding falls prevention? And I would suggest that they contact you directly and then you can coordinate that or get someone to coordinate that. I think probably sure. the best yeah. way. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're referring to a general false prevention strategy or if it's specific to thinking of um, you know, residents with vision loss, but it's, it's yes. something we have put together and would be happy to provide any, any uh, homes um, outside of, you know, client service as well. So for sure, mm -hmm. they can contact me. And if it is for general falls prevention, you know, that for the long-term care homes, of course, you can connect with the long-term care best practice team. And there, there is a, a long-term care best practice coordinator assigned to every home in the province. So we're there for you. So connect with us. Um, we have a comment from Melissa, very good presentation, already started updating some care plans with some of the great interventions discussed. Excellent, Melissa. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. I think another thing to just keep in mind, you know, um, you know, especially if we have individuals, seniors who have lived in their home for many, many, many years, you know, 30 plus years, and then they have a, you know, maybe they fall, uh, they go into the hospital, they had a hip fracture, they decline, and then they don't go back home and they come back, they go to a long-term care center. So they may have done quite well in their own home because they've lived there for 30 years. And even if their vision was was uh, starting to go, they probably, you know, were able to compensate and knew where everything was in their home. But, you know, then quite often there's that element of, you know, going to the hospital, sometimes confusion, then going to a long-term care home. And then, you know, if they do have glasses, it doesn't always make it, you know, to the home. So just, just recognizing, I think, you know, uh, and I'm, I've been working with vision loss rehab for three years. I, like I said, uh, I've been in the healthcare business for 20 and uh, OT, my background, um, you know, I don't think and vision loss is always factored into the healthcare plans of, of many of our clients. So just maybe keeping that in mind, you know, as new clients come in and, and understanding that there's potential vision impairment there and, and how that could impact. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have another question from Deb. Do you include education for staff on vision changes relative to dementia? i.e. inability to recognize objects so may not pick up utensils and stop feeding themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of part of our individualized approach to client service where a lot of our, um, a lot of the people we serve will have a CVI, a stroke or dementia, as you've mentioned. And so um, where one strategy, general strategy that we've kind of outlined for this presentation might not work for them, if a home is working through a situation that you've described, we'll do our best to provide sort of alternative um, resources, um, strategies, best practice that's worked for uh, clients we've worked with with that particular um, concern. Yep, absolutely. It's wonderful, thanks Ed. And um, 
Just to let you know that RNAO also has a delirium, dementia, and depression um, best practice guideline, and we do gap analyses on that as well and implement evidence-based practice related to dementia. Um, so if that's something that you'd be interested in as well, there's no limit, I think, to the number of partners you can have collaborating for the benefit of the residents. So I would suggest uh, reaching out to the long-term care best practice coordinator as well. I'm just thinking back to um, the participant who mentioned that she was updating care plans with different interventions. And one thing that I found in the homes that tends to get missed is not just labeling glasses with the residents' names, but labeling the glasses as to what they're used for, because there's nothing worse than putting on your reading glasses and then trying to walk down the hall. So when you have residents with vision loss, you really need to understand what these glasses are being used for and make sure that um, the right glasses are being put on at the right time. Thank you. Labeling is definitely a big part of our service and keeping things organized. I think we've highlighted that a number of times. So that's uh, definitely a good point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Lolly's put the link for um, the guideline for the, the delirium, dementia, and depression. Uh, guideline in the chat if you wanted to copy that and maybe paste it into into your um, into a word document or into your email that would be a good reference for you and I do encourage you to make referrals I think uh, what is it our executive director Lisa she calls us the best kept secret so um, uh, we really are here for your clients and and for you guys and uh, we you know, so please reach out. The scenario I described for you happened more times than I can count over the 12 years of service that I, I did. Um, it, the number of clients that sometimes go slightly identified as having vision loss and could maybe use some help. And um, we stepped in a little bit later. Um, that came up more often than not over the course of my time as a service provider. So. Um, it doesn't hurt to speak to the clients, or sorry, to the residents about uh, their vision loss. And as, as Josie mentioned, if you feel that a referral is necessary or could help, or even an assessment um, that doesn't go any further than recommendations, we're happy to step in and uh, make those for you. That's great, Ed. Thank you. And that, that would work well, I think, with a lot of the assessments that the falls prevention teams do in long-term care. So they look at Footwear, they look at time of day, medications, hydration, leg strength, all of those things. But I don't know how often, um, especially over the course of the pandemic, that they've been able to access, you know, uh, vision loss uh, assessment services, um, you know, assessment by optometrists, ophthalmologists, et cetera. So I think um, we've got, well, I know we've got a lot of catching up to do you know, related to the pandemic. And we have a lot of work ahead of us to meet the new um, proposed regulations in long-term care. Um, but, you know, today's webinar was a good start, I think, uh, for all the people on the call. We know now that there's help out there and support out there. And, um, you know, even if we help 10 people, then it will be worthwhile. Yeah. All right, so if there's, is there any other question or questions? We have three minutes left. Okay, nothing. All right, thank you all very, very much for your time, your attention, for the great questions. And uh, as mentioned, you'll be getting the information sent to you via email. And you've now got two minutes back in your day. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Thanks, everyone. everybody. Thank and you. Josie, Ed, and Lee. So Lolly, would you mind staying on the call? Sure.